It's a beautiful day to become a citizen. Renounce and adjure. Renounce and adjure. All allegiance and fidelity. To any foreign prince, any foreign prince. Potentate, potentate, state or sovereignty. State or sovereignty. So, help me God. so help me God. I want to be a citizen uh, because here uh, I have every human right. <laughs> In my country, <laughs> there is no such human rights there. I feel so happy to be a U.S. citizen, you know, and be able to vote and probably run for an office. I always dream big to come here and, you know, get a job and work and, you know, be free from police brutality in my country, so I decided to come here. You may have noticed America has been changed by immigration in the past few decades. Here in southeastern Michigan, the change is obvious in the cities of Detroit and nearby Hamtramck and Dearborn. Change is also obvious far from the Detroit area in rural Ottawa County on Michigan's west coast. And in tourist cities like Holland, As a nation of immigrants, we regularly honor our European ancestors and their legacies. In these programs, we will visit Holland, Michigan, to see how one community with a strong European legacy handles the major issues associated with major cultural change. And now, in the early 21st century, we're trying to understand better the Latino, Asian, and Arab cultures, as millions of these new Americans continue to honor the traditions of their homelands. It ain't Marvin Gaye, but it's a little of a Puerto remix, claro que sí. For all you English people, they like a poquito de musica. Puro Latino, all right. Immigration is the lifeblood of our nation of immigrants. But how do we decide who these immigrants will be and how many should be allowed to come here? But since the end of the great wave of immigration in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century, we've had a difficult time trying to answer these questions. Our nation is distinctive because we are not held together by a tribal or a racial or blood myth. The United States is a nation that is based on an idea. Its founding myth holds that it, this country, this nation, was established as an asylum for others to come here and to be and to become involved in their mastering their own lives, to be 
people who could take advantage of opportunities that were afforded by this vast continent, to people who would be protected by a bigger idea of equality and freedom uh, and equal under the law. So this founding myth that we were established for this person, which took hold in the speeches of Washington and Jefferson and so on from the very beginning and is in our poetry and is in the memoirs of immigrants uh, from the very beginning to the, very, to the present time. Uh, this founding myth uh, then developed a compelling narrative, a history in which the myth was lived in reality enough, not perfectly by a long shot, but enough so that it re-energized the myth and made it an attractive place for persons all over the world. Well, Ellis Island opened in the 1890s. It, it had a fire and they had to close it for a while. They reopened it and it functioned during the great wave of immigration uh, from the 1890s down to the 1920s. And it was a receiving uh, point for basically Europeans. So this was the centerpiece of European immigration during that period, uh, which we sometimes call the, the Great Wave or the First Wave. About a third of the immigrants came through here total, and during the peak of immigration, uh, more than two out of three came through Ellis Island. So being the largest place, it obviously does have that significance. Uh, in 1882, the federal government moved more directly into immigration, and two things happened then. One, they began to set up procedures and take over the screening of immigrants, and of course they also abolished in 1882 the Chinese. Uh, and from then on, the federal government exercises control over immigration right down to the present day. When the federal government began to regulate immigration in 1882, it added more and more to the restricted groups uh, so that if you were a pauper likely to become a public charge you couldn't come in. In 1903 they outlawed anarchists from coming to the United States. They added people who might be imbeciles or they added people who might have a loathsome or infectious disease. So they began to build upon that. But these particular pieces of legislation were not really a deterrent in terms of the overall gross uh, numbers. In the 1890s Henry Cabot Lodge and others came up with the idea of a literacy test. It was passed several times. Presidents vetoed it. Finally, over Woodrow Wilson's uh, veto in 1917, just before World War I, Congress passed the literacy test. Now, the test goes into effect during the war, and the war disrupted immigration more than any test, so they really weren't sure uh, what its impact would be. After the war, 800,000 immigrants come to the United States again. So it was becoming clear to people in Congress that in order to cut down on immigration, a literacy test was not going to do it. More and more people from southern, eastern Europe, Mediterranean area were able to pass that test. So instead of going to these things which were not based upon one nationality, that is anarchism, health, and so forth, they decided to go to the national origin system, which was a more direct way of restricting immigration. Finally, the national origin system, as it finally went into effect in 1929, used uh, a figure of roughly 150,000 and was based upon the 1920 census. But not the census of the foreign born, but the whole white population, which meant all the generations of Germans, Irish, Scots, and so it would come in colonial America, would get the lion's share. A couple of figures are in order here. Italy, in some years of the first decade of the 20th century, was sending 250,000 people to the United States a year. The Italian quota was under 6,000. That's a tremendous drop. Uh, and Germany, Great Britain, and, and Ireland had the bulk of the slots. Whether, whether English were going to come here or not is another matter. They were given the slots. That's what Congress intended, namely to keep out people they considered to be inferior and troublesome, meddlesome uh, from southern, eastern European uh, countries. It's like a ship. It's a mirror of America, every ship that comes to New York Harbor. It looks exactly like the American people. Just a certain percentage from England, a certain percentage from Sweden, a certain percentage from Spain. That was the national origin system. The idea of America has been overwhelmed by powerful and influential myths. The Statue of Liberty had nothing to do with immigration. But somehow, somebody really smart put on a campaign over a series of years, and now you ask anybody, and there's no difference. The Statue of Liberty has to do with the Golden Door. Uh, g give me your poor masses. Well, it's not true. The Statue of Liberty 
was given to the American people by the French people, the French nation. Uh, and, it, and, it had a, and it put a, little, a name on it. And the name on the lady is Liberty Enlightening the World. They were, they, were t they were giving the American people in admiration a statue which, 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 which said, this is what America means to the world. That's the way to run a society. Model your society on that society. And she's got a book of laws here and in one hand and the torch in the other. It's got nothing to do with asylum. That was grafted on later. That's just one of the myths that you can't puncture. It's everlasting. In 1965, President Johnson decided it was time for Congress to end the national origins basis of our immigration law. Since then, the number of immigrants entering legally each year has increased dramatically, and European immigrants are now far outnumbered by Latino, Asian, and Middle Eastern immigrants. The main way we let people in is if they have a relative in the United States. That makes up the bulk of U.S. immigration. And it's not based on whether you have any skills or anything like that. It's just that you've, you're related to someone here who sponsored you. Just the larger the legal immigrant population in the United States, that then creates a desire or stimulates that much more immigration or desire to come from other countries. We did believe that our bill would have negligible impact on the population of the United States. We were talking about quota immigration of, I think it was 165,000 immigrants per year. And of course the country was something like 200 million. So the idea that, that any tinkering you did with this number of people uh, in the immigrant stream would affect the makeup of the population was just silly. It was just uh, not going to happen. We did try to figure out how many immigrants were going to come from where under our new system. With the help of the Immigration Service, we came up with some numbers and statistics. But basically, our approach to the, to the Congress was that this was a, a bill that would be fair, that would treat all people and all nations uh, the same. It would regulate quota immigration to the United States in a manner that was in the interests of our country, that would give preference to people who could help the country and who could help families, citizens of our country. Uh, and it, it really isn't going to have any effect on the population because we're only talking about 165,000 people and their immediate families. I'm smiling because, as you know, it has turned out not to be that way, but that was certainly our view at the time. But we didn't know that Congress was going to um, increase the numbers and do all sorts of things that later were done.